going to talk about new technology in the hay field, um, and then we'll have Morgan come talk a little bit about facilities. So, Josh, without further ado, I'll let you take off and, and update us on some new technology options. Okay, so uh, one of the things that's, I think, gaining some popularity a lot, a lot with producers, and it's kind of uh, been more so a toy, and I think it can be a tool potentially here in the future, is the use of, uh, use of drones. So we actually got it shown right there, and then what we found has been interesting as we've been flying over alfalfa. So that's one of the primary crops in which we're looking at uh, and seeing how it performs, how we can estimate yields as we've been flying out there. We're, we're circling the field, and we actually get a lot of turkey vultures uh, coming out there and circling with us as well. So let's see something going on. So they come out there and follow us. So it's been, that's been kind of interesting, uh, neat little fact. And so we think about the drones potential in agriculture. And I'm gonna, there's a lot of synonymous terms with drones. So it's unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned aerial systems, remotely piloted vehicles, but it all means the same thing. You know, we're out there using this to help us monitor, you know, whether it be livestock or crops, whatever it may be. Um, looking at, you know, specifically in this case, looking at alfalfa. And so there's many different types. There's a fixed wing type. Uh, it's going to be look more like a plane. You take off and land. That's going to require a larger area for takeoff and landing. But the main one, you know, is going to be the multi-rotor type that we use, which you typically see is your Phantom 4 multi-rotor where we have four rotors, six, eight, you know, as many as you want to put on there. And so these can be up to 55 pounds to fly, you know, for recreational or for commercial purposes. And so, you know, the, the main benefit about having a drone is I can set it pretty much anywhere and it, can, it has vertical takeoff and landing. So take off and go and fly. And so with a lot of these, you typically get uh, maybe 20 minutes or 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes of flight potentially, depending on how much weight you put on there, how much, how windy it is that day. So different flight parameters. So this is something we're trying to think about and trying to see if this could be a useful tool um, for alfalfa. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunities here, we think, and we're just trying to see, separate, you know, really, you know, there's a lot of hype. We're trying to separate, you know, fact from fiction. Is the hype really worth it? Can we utilize these in an effective manner on the farm? And I'm actually going to talk about, you know, the actual machinery here as well. But I thought this is an interesting topic as well. Um, and so there, there are regulations. There are regulations. So, you know, with the FAA, we have to get these UA, these UAVs or drones registered. So it's $5 registration fee. Uh, because of the events at the Gadwick Airport, uh, we now have to put our uh, UAV flight number on the outside of the UAV. It used to be you could put it underneath the battery compartment or somewhere where you could get to it without having a screwdriver. Now, because of the Gadwick Airport where they thought there was a drone and whatever it was, um, you know, now we have to make sure that you know, we, we fly safe. There are you know, certain flight restrictions logically around airports. Uh, which we have to take into consideration. Um, and, and if we're operating in a commercial setting, so if there's recreational, you go out there and just fly for fun, you don't have to have a license. But commercially, you know, we, we would need a license. We would need a license to fly. And so we have to take a knowledge test. The knowledge test is 60, 60 questions. You have to get 70% or greater on this test to pass. Um, and it just goes over and you know, knowing our airspace, there's apps that help you determine, you know, is this safe airspace to fly in? Where exactly, you know, is there an airport nearby? Am I within the five nautical miles of the airport? And so with that in mind, you know, the Part 107, 90% of people who take this test pass for the commercial operation or for the commercial uh, license. So this is, I've got a license. A couple of people in my department have a license because we're doing this for extension and other purposes. Uh, but 90%, and right now there's greater than 50,000 commercial drone pilots here in the United States. And so right now you can only fly one drone at a time. You can only fly within line of sight. You know, there are certain waivers you can get to, uh, and you can only fly during the daylight hours. And so there are certain waivers you can apply to get uh, those lifted if you had a special circumstance which you need to fly at night. There are waivers you can apply for so that you can fly at night. So usually it's from dawn to dusk is typically what you're allowed to fly with for a UAV. And there are certain times when we actually are flying, you know, flying at noon may be more desirable for taking really high definition or uh, really high quality images. You know, noon would probably be the best just for certain aspects. But you can fly it, you know, towards dawn or dusk if you're actually out there checking cattle or checking your crops, whatever it may be. And from a weather standpoint, you're not supposed to fly in inclement weather. But you're not supposed to fly in inclement weather. You're supposed to have three miles of visibility. You fly up to 400 feet ceiling. 
above ground level as your ceiling. And so this is just something to keep in mind. So you can actually see when you're flying at 400 feet uh, for the typical Phantom 4, you can see about five acres or so. And so then it gets on how much resolution with the, with the default camera that's on there. So how much resolution do you need? How useful will this be to your operation? We're trying to figure out, you know, yield maps. And so some of our, you know, the topics for the test would be, you know, just related to regulations. Pretty much assume if anything goes wrong or if you do over $500 for the damage is going to be your fault and uh, you, there are certain times which you have to report to the FAA um, depending on how much damage you've done. Um, there's airspace requirements, so there's going to be class, you know, BCD airspace that we have to think about. So whether it's airports and E, untowered airports, something to think about. Weather, like I said, certain amount of visibility, uh, loading performance, the more weight we put on there, the less, less duration we're going to be able to fly, and operations. So 60 questions, just have to get 70% on, $150, good for two years. That's the current regulations as they stand now. Uh, so let's see, this is Bluegrass Airport, and so this outer circle here is actually the five mile radius. So we are, you know, pretty much right here. We're still within that, that radius, five mile radius of the airport. So that class, I think it's C airspace, I want to say. Um, and so technically we need permission from the air traffic controller to fly. If we were flying outside, we would technically need permission to fly. If we're flying indoor, inside of here, we'd be fine, but uh, we would technically need permission to fly. And so, for the most part, you know, we're at the Woodford County Farm. You know, we're just, with UK's Woodford County Farm, we're just over here. Don't have to worry about it. But if we were flying within that five mile radius, you know, that's something we had to consider. You know, the, granted, the aircraft, you know, big passenger plane shouldn't be at 400 feet, but it is a consideration, is a safety factor. So, um, so how, how are we going to use these? How are we using these drones? You know, really, what do we do with it? So, we're looking at uh, plant height trying to figure out, you know, getting this to eventually to a volume, trying to count, the, is there a way to potentially, or at some point, count the number of plants. There are certain ones that you have different apps that um, you can count the plants. Um, how accurate they are is still yet to be determined. Um, there's plant height or plant health, you know, looking at the presence of nutrients. We can actually look at different spectral bands. So there's visible light and there's infrared light. So we can use uh, different aspects of those to figure out, you know, is there, you know, the presence of nutrients, presence of disease, um, how certain light gets reflected will be indicative of, uh, you know, drought, drought stress, you know, presence of weed. And so we're trying to really get to that relative biomass estimate in the field. So when you think about with corn production or any other crop, we can estimate, well, this section of the field produced uh, this many bushels per acre. And so we don't we can tell, I can, t for the most part, you know, farmers tell me I got this many bales off of this field. I can kind of, I can tell you where this is the most productive part of my field, and that isn't. Well, how much more productive? And so really we're trying, you know, my goal would be to try to quantify across that alfalfa field what's the level of production, you know, when we get to precision ag principles and find, you know, more nutrients to spots that need it, less to, do to those that don't. So your overall fertilizer used to be the same, but it's being used more efficiently. And so that would be our overall goal of trying to figure some of this stuff out. And that, you know, 3D volume, you know, could be we figure out the, whole, the volume of a whole pond, um, hills, you know, if we're having to cut fill, that can be a useful, somewhat of a useful tool uh, we can use with different drones. So we have our alfalfa, you know, if we're looking at just visible images, uh, you know, we're coming in there, flying over, how useful is it? So, you know, when we take a side view, you make a pass with your cutter, you can kind of see from a side view, you know, how much material is actually there. You know, you have parts that are going to be thicker and thinner. And so when we're looking at it from the top with a drone, you know, those two from the top view are going to be looking fairly similar. Um, and so how do we really distinguish? And so there's other technologies. So we're going to use something called uh, LIDAR. So there's sonar, that uses sound waves. Uh, radar uses radio waves. And so LIDAR, it's going to be using uh, laser, different, different lasers. And so we'll have different channels for our laser. It'll send those out, bounce back, measure the time, and so that gets a distance measurement. And so the different points in which it hits the plant can help us determine that density, help us determine how much material is out there. And so going back to this slide, so we're, you know, we're going through with LIDAR, we're scanning that field. If it's really dense, we're expecting to see uh, different density measurements just based upon you know, where those points are located. If it's going to be a tall and dense stand, 
uh, tall, thin stand, short and dense or short and thin. And alternatively, we're just using a stock drones, Phantom 4, whatever it may be, to go around the field, take multiple images, stitch those together, you know, with a certain percentage of overlap, stitch them together, and then create a 3D surface in that way. So in either case, we're trying to be able to see um, the ground beneath it and also the, the, the leaves on the plant so we can get a, a really good estimation of that volume. And so this is the raw, this is how the raw images of what we have. We just stand there and hold our LiDAR system. So it's recording, it's got 16 different channels of light in which recording, each channel is gonna be recording uh, 20,000 points a second. So all, t all told, we're recording about 320,000 points a second. And so seeing how far we can go with that measurement, how far out we can go and still be accurate, you know, what speed we can go, because as we increase the speed in which we were flying, it's still emitting those 320,000 points at a fairly constant rate. So how would that change our overall accuracy, or how would that degrade it as we're flying through the field? And so then being able to do the post-processing to handle all that information as well. And see, so we can also, you know, in this case, we had overlaid our actual imagery on top of the points in which we recorded, and able to calculate a volume that way. And so like I said before, you know, really we go through and take a stand, we've got a thick stand of alfalfa versus a thin stand, making sure we can quantify, you know, what is the difference between the two. And so this is actually our LIDAR, this is one of our LIDAR testing stations. And so in this case, we actually have it hooked up to a, uh, a, a track here. So this is what we use to measure our changes in velocity. So we, because with the drone, we have a lot more variables we have to think about. So in this case, we're just looking at how velocity change that's relatively fixed. Uh, but with the drone, we have pitch, roll, you know, doing barrel rolls, well, not doing barrel rolls, but roll of the UAV, and then yaw, where that we have that, that is an additional layer of variation we'll have to see, you know, as the wind blows, as certain aspects happen as you're flying, it's not going to be quite perfect level. Uh, so this is why we set up this stand, trying to see, you know, how much variation are we seeing with that LIDAR, then we get that integrated into the, with the UAV and see, all right, so we, we have this, you know, ground, this is our best case scenario. How, how much worse does our signal get when we actually go and fly a drone? So there will be a lot of variation we could see with this, or been, kind of been seeing with it. And so we pull those points out and see how it really, really changes. So it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, for the most part, the max height we measure for our plant is going to be about 39 inches with this LiDAR system. We get up to about two, three miles an hour. Then when you get up to, you know, five miles an hour, we see that the max height we're obtaining and reading at steady state on that track was going to be, uh, it, it decreases down to 33. So we see rest res re less resolution. We're also getting fewer points on there as well. So the, po the points that we measure in there are directly, or directly proportional to the inverse of our velocity. Um, I believe I'm saying that right. And so in this case, we have our overall points. We've cut out the actual uh, cubic meter. So that's one cubic meter we're trying to measure there. And then actually getting our point cloud of just our alfalfa. And so overall volume, I mean, we, there's different ways to skin a cat. We're trying to get this to figure out, you know, what's the best way of calculating that volume and relating that to yield for you know, using this LIDAR system. And so we've gotten a couple. We see as the speed increases, you know, the, by the different methods. We've got block method where we divide it into uh, different, like 100, that, that same meat, cubic meter, divided into 100 different blocks by surface area, and then uh, figuring our volume that way. Octatree, we're dividing each one into progressively smaller, uh, well, quadrants, cubes of eight, essentially. Alpha volume, where we're just, alpha shape, where we're just taking and draping a layer over all those points to, try to calculate our volume. So different ways, skinning a cat, but we're seeing the least amount of variation with uh, the alpha shape method. So that might be the one we use. We're trying to figure out which one of these is going to be correlating best with, you know, we see the variations just created with speed, which one's going to be the best way to determine our volume for our, our alfalfa. Um, and taking, you know, our physical properties, you go out there, we have, you know, a number of these set out. We're recording our GPS points because we have to relate all this information from the LiDAR system into, from a spherical coordinate system to Cartesian. So little nuances, but um, you know, trying to make sure we can really get an accurate measurement and see what variation we have using these systems. So you know, we'll throw a bunch of these. They look like the things you put in your, you see in your pizza, center of your pizza almost. But uh, 
you know, we put these out there and you can see the drones way up there. So kind of hard to see, but uh, you know, we're flying this PLT and can we really estimate or use these to help us estimate that yield? And then val you know, validate, we're flying, can we just validate just on the photogrammetry in this case? So photogrammetry, we created this 3D image. So we're going, flying around the field, uh, flying around some of those points and trying to see if we fly around at different angles, uh, can we take all those different images, we're able to stitch them together using different programs, and then get a volume of material that way. We can create, get a surface of material that way. And so again, trying to get an overall volume. So we got the LiDAR method, we're trying to use photogrammetry. The advantage of this is, we can take any off the shelf, most off the shelf drones, and just make this work for us. So we can take it off the shelf and go fly. With the LiDAR, you have to personal distance the LiDAR, make sure it connects to your system, get it powered in some way, shape, or form. This one, we can just go and fly. But well, regular, regular Phantom 4 or whatever it may be. And so from the UAV, we're flying about 20 feet because we want to have a high resolution. But you can, we are trying to figure out if we can fly higher, fly faster, to still get that volume estimation. So we'll see if this video is going to work or not. Maybe not. Could be because it's on a regular. But let's skip. Maybe skip ahead to the next slide here. Oh, cannot play media. Now we can skip ahead to the next slide here. So in either, in any case, you know we're able to get, you know, again we, we're calculating our volume, our flat volume, surface area, you know, trying to see how many are higher than our mean mean height, trying to figure out what parameter really can tell us or help us determine, you know, accurately get our yields. And so that's what we're working through with Ag Engineering. So right now I can tell you from the LiDAR standpoint, a lot more work has to be done. A lot more work has to be done. Photogrammetry, there's still some limitations with the G GPS. Um, to some degree, they're, they're getting better, but um, with post-processing kinematics. But there are, there are limitations, you know, looking at the two, we see a similar kind of histogram, although shifted to the left for, for the, um, the LiDAR system. So we're trying to figure out, if we have all these points, you know, we got this LiDAR point cloud created from the photogrammetry, all those stitch images, we actually create another point cloud as well. And so between the two, you know, trying to figure out which one's gonna be more accurate, accurate and cost effective. So right now, you know, just looking at it from a quick and easy standpoint, it, you know, potentially could be the photogrammetry aspect. We're trying to get an estimation of our yield in field. And so, you know, what I can say now, you know, for, you know, if you need a drone, if you have your kids, you know, want to get them as a toy, you know, go out there and buy it for them. But don't, you know, really think about, you know, how you're going to use this. Try to really think about, you know, I'm not saying go out and buy a drone. I'm just saying that it's something, if you do it, think about how you're going to use it um, ahead of time. Or how, how you, know, you need to check your cows, check your, think of productive purposes to do with it first. Because there are certain limitations and you know, there's costs to those post-processing programs. And so make sure there's some value to that data before you go and purchase one of these. So we're, there's still a lot of work to be done with both of those. But it, it is an option if you want to try to use it. Yeah, so we're, we're trying, that's why we have it across, you know, across that field. And, and that's, that's something we're lacking, you know, with the, that's why I have all those cubes. We actually go out, or those, one meter, cubic meter, we go out there and harvest that by hand in each one of those sections to say, okay, this is what it was in this section. And so that, that's, that's something I want to really stress about too is uh, there's a lot of um, apps that will create you a pretty map. It'll be red, you know, red, bad, green, good. And so, you know, what, how, I, you know, a lot of times I don't know, how, well, how do they validate that? Because it takes a lot of work to validate that. Or is it just, you know, them giving you their best estimation. So a lot of that, I'm, I'm highly skeptical usually when I see something that says, oh yeah, we'll give you this, this or that, or a visible NDVI or something like that. And, and a lot of times I'm just skeptical initially um, of how do they do the validation. Is that, you know, is it really gonna be accurate? Because there's a lot of times if you get the NDVI, you know, it's how green is the plant. You know, Johnson grass is also green. So it'll tell you, it'll lie to you that way to some degree. About 10 minutes, okay. Um, and so, it can be a tool, but I'm not saying, right now I'm saying let the research catch up to the hype. Um, 
And so, we th you know, coming to the actual hay, you know, thing about hay machinery. So we have that drone, potentially evaluate it for, um, you know, our yields. So we'll talk about actual hay machinery. You know, our overall goal is to harvest as much hay as possible. And I wanted to ask Greg, you know, how, what does it take to cost out a, a Klaus Cougar or something like that? <laughs> What's it take to pay that off? And that'd be, that'd be really nice. But you can go 50 acres in an hour, you lay down. And so every year I want them to bring that to farm show because I keep wanting to look at it. It's just, just, it's an impressive machine. But, you know, we're really trying to optimize that forage and yield uh, quality for livestock, but doing it in a timely manner that's cost effective. Um, you know, and we think about the nutritional, nutritional requirements of our cattle. You know, it's going to be proportional, you know, to 3% of their body weight. So it could be, you know, based upon their age, you know, level of production of dairy cows, going to take a lot more groceries than any other type of animal. Uh, looking at our breed, I'd expect, you know, disclaimer, I'm an Angus person, you know, Angus to be a little more efficient than a Charlotte, disclaimer. But, uh, you know, in the physiology, or are they lactating, are they gestating, you know, where are they in their production cycle, you know, and then just the environment. If it's going to be colder out, they're going to be needing more groceries um, the season, and then, you know, mud may be an issue, and, and other factors. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody's seen something like this here recently. I'm, I think, uh, you know, the beast forage guy is going to become really important in the next couple months here, trying to figure out, well, what do I do? You know, maybe, maybe I won't be able to get out there in August. But what do I do when it comes time to actually try to fix this? And so, uh, you know, mud. And it's, it, they're having to use more energy. So about tw 25, depending, depending on how bad it is, 25 to 40% more energy um, dedicated to just moving around in that mud. So... This is, you know, a serious concern. You know, having geotextile fabric, having something like NRCS, can be helpful. Um, you know, this is a system uh, Dr. Hayes put in. I put in something similar to this. You know, where we just have a feeding area, but this still, from a environment, well, from a standpoint, you actually have to get in here every about two weeks or so and clean this out. And so that can be a challenge, especially when we have all this rain. Uh, planning for the proper manure storage when we get one of these systems can be essential as well. So. Uh, but, you know, they are good because cattle are on there. Make sure you've got it so you can unload feed or your hay quickly and easily. Uh, but getting back, to our, getting back to our machinery. So that's the why. But getting back to our machinery, there's going to be trade-offs. You know, you've got to have, you know, really two things in life. You've got to have money or time to do something. And so you can either spend a whole lot or have something that's going to be cheaper, but maybe you can work on. And so that gets back to Greg. How do you cost it out? How, do you, how are you able to justify, you know, purchasing, you know, cloths or do you just purchase New Holland? old New Holland 467. That'll get the job done. It'll take you a while, but it's probably a little easier to work on. Parts will be cheaper. Um, looking at ease of operation, repair and maintenance. Repair and maintenance is uh, also a huge issue. Trying to think about, it comes back to cost a little bit, because whenever the 467 breaks, it'll be somewhat expensive, but if you have a part on that go down, anything hydraulic is going to be spendy, spendy. So, you know, and we're, we're always trying to, you know, this, this seems like it's from last year. It's doing the old pinches maneuver on us. And we just had, we've had to deal with this this past year, dealing with it now. You know, just all this rainfall, you know, with our, you know, thinking about the speed of operation, you know, how quickly can we get out into that field, get it down, get it up, get it back up. And so this past year, we had relatively few windows. It was few and far between. Once you got past September, man, you were, you couldn't, find, you couldn't buy a good day. And so... I think that's been you know, a lot of people's hay challenges. You usually get you know, maybe some, a couple days in October. Wasn't, wasn't happening. Maybe a decent day, you know, maybe Indian summer in November. Didn't happen. And so it was just really challenging. So really think about you know, the speed of your operation, number of drying days, you know, what's, your, you know, what's your harvesting losses, and then um, what's the ease of operation, ease of repair. You know, is it, you know, a, lot, a lot of times they say, well, you can find you know, John Deere dealerships all around, so it's easy to find green parts. And so, you know, just depending on what's around you, what dealership, you know, would probably uh, dictate, you know, how easy you can acquire some of your parts. You know, some of the older tractors may not have a, you have to go to a salvage yard. And so, you know, really, you know, come to this point, you know, a lot of these forage guys have stressed this for years, you know, that 70% of your quality is determined, determined by maturity. So knowing when to cut. So just being able to get out there and get it done it's going to be really important. Uh, so something I you know, want to hit upon here, you know, this ISO bus control, you know, that, this is a really, really nice feature of newer tractors. 
And so this is going to be one of the newer, newer technological aspects. But you can have all that information in one place. And you don't need, really need that standalone barrel monitor anymore. It's, you can pull in your, for, for us, you know, we get, the engineers get excited about, oh, we have to fuel that, we got this data. Everything we need is right there, our engine RPMs, everything. So, you know, we're, we're excited from the standpoint of just pulling data off. But, you know, that's an all-in-one screen to give you some of that more information. So for case, um, IH, I think it's going to be your 2016 and newer tractors. Um, it's going to have uh, your, your Puma and your, uh, your bigger tractors, your Maximum. I think we'll have this type of ISO bus. And so it allows for interconnectivity uh, between different implements and different, different tractors. So this is, should be a common protocol on your newer ones. So uh, that can be a powerful, powerful tool. Um, we get into the ISO bus and automation. So this is where things are changing. Um, it eliminates the need for separate monitors. So that's been one. But, and I just mentioned that, but it provides provides more control. So they do have the case New Holland Bay line. I'm, I'm not, I wasn't able to make it around farm show as much as I wanted to this year. Um, but there are, you know, manufacturers in which you can pretty much have it automatically stop. The bale will tell the tractor to automatically stop. It'll wrap the bale and automatically eject the bale. So all you have to do is hit the lever and start rolling again. And so it, it's automating a lot of that process. And so uh, it's, it's going to take a little more money, but uh, it's, it can be worth that input. So there's different standards for this. It allows some interconnectivity. So your ISO bus 2 is going to allow for just communication. The ISO bus 3 is going to allow for automation. So that's that's an important factor here. So now, you know, we have a cutter, we have our, but the baler, you know, I think is where we're seeing the biggest changes. And we see that, you know, Vermeer has their own, you know, pretty much self-propelled baler. We have certain aspects of that automated as well. And so really in the future, it's just going to be automation. And so I'm going to talk, you know, really briefly about, you know, maintenance strategies. But, you know, really, you got three of them. You need to run to failure, um, preventive, do your prevent maintenance, do as life happens. So run to failure is going to be good for a light bulb or something not really important. It can break, and then you're good to go. But, uh, whoops. Um, and, you know, mention the cost. You know, we try to budget. So the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers standard for repairs and maintenance is going to be, Five to ten percent of your overall value for equipment. So in this case, I assume you have about two hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment, and so we're going to have to be spending at least, you know, potentially, you know, budget for ten to two thousand dollars potentially of repairs. You know, just thinking about that, if the injector pump goes down, there it goes three grand. If you lose a tire on the tractor, maybe it could be, depending on which tire, it could be up to thousand dollars or something. So think about that as well. Um, I'm going to skip these because I want to hit one hot button issue. So newer equipment uh, should work fairly well. Uh, and this was actually, you know, this, this tractor had less than 50 hours on it. And we pulled it out from the dealership, went about a quarter mile down the road, and all of a sudden it felt like it was raining. And it was a sunny, sunny day. And it turned out it was hydraulic food, a line of buses. So, you know, just because it's new doesn't mean it'll work all the time, but it should. Uh, and then it's also got more safety. So every time your butt got out of that seat, man, it was beeping and yelling, screaming at you. So that's just something, you know, as an engineer, I understand the importance of safety. But as a farmer, man, that stuff will drive you nuts. <laughs> and so a lot of the newer ones, you know, going to be a lot easier to, to operate. But, you know, the real question is, you know, one of these two tractors are going to require software to run. And so in the olden days, you know, whoever, who, you know, think about who owns a tractor, well, simple. It's whoever was the last bidder. It could be your, your dad, mom, spouse, you know, yourself, the bank, whoever owns that tractor. But now, you know, with all this software, it depends. And so there's actually, you know, a lot of um, problems. That, you know, they want if you get a newer piece of equipment, they want you to take it back to the dealership to have it worked on. And so there's a lot of legislation out west and in other states as far as this right to repair. You know, should you have the ability to repair your own equipment without it voiding your warranty? And so simplistically, you know, I'm going to go real quick here. It boils down to money. Um, you know, from a farmer standpoint, it's creating scheduling conflicts because you have to get a dealer or dealer representative to come out there, work on your tractor, or take it to the dealership. So it represents more downtime. And there's this assumption that if you take it to a dealership, there's going to be more cost. And then from their standpoint, they're looking at it from legal liability. Are you making modifications to this software? you know, to alter your emissions, to alter other safety factors, and then they'd be somehow liable. So that's, this is going to be, you know, I mean, it's like, I'm, 
I personally don't have um, new equipment, but this could be something that's important for a lot of farms in the future. So California, you know, their, their farm bureau, they're working with different ones trying to, you know, just really set up and different, you know, it's not just California, it's other states as well, um, you know, looking at this right to repair issue. And so, you know, who does these big equipment companies have behind them? Well, it's actually Apple. You know, thinking about your phone, you have to go to the Apple store to actually get it fixed. And so then who, who really owns it? You know, do I own it or am I just using their software? So this has kind of become a big issue. And my thought is, you know, in my, my future vision, you know, of talking about new equipment, it's going to become more automated. Um, repairs, you know, this, may, this is an issue right now if you're getting new equipment, but it might not be an issue in the future. I don't think uh, maybe we wouldn't need equipment to last as long. So maybe getting back to Greg's thing, I'm going to think completely differently. It's like maybe we don't need our tractors to last 20 years. Maybe they should only last five years. We just replace them. Be more like a, you know, a really, really, really expensive cell phone. And so, you know, then you'd have to really maximize your value. And so that's, that's the kind of, you know, it, it'd be like Tesla and different ones. He says, I'm not selling a car, I'm selling you software. And so they're going to become more and more software, more and more automation in the future, as far as what I'm seeing, envisioning. Um, and it, it just changes the dynamic. But I'll, I'll stop there, taking enough time. Your equipment.